I was worried about getting through this whole book when we decided to do it. Because sometimes I'll laze about on reading a book, but I think since we have deadlines on reading, it's actually forcing me to read. Yeah, I thought about that yesterday. (laughs) Which is like, oh, I can still read. He walked out in the gray light and stood and he saw for a brief moment the absolute truth of the world. The cold relentless circling of the intestate earth. Darkness implacable. The blind dogs of the sun in their running. The crushing black vacuum of the universe. And somewhere 200 animals trembling like ground foxes in their cover. Borrowed time and borrowed world and borrowed eyes with which to sorrow it. And lo, for the earth was empty of form, and void, and darkness was all over the face of the deep, and we said, look at that fucker dance. So welcome back to Heat Death of the Universe Book Club Edition, part two. Uh, what book are we reading? I forgot. We are we are reading The Empire of Pain, the secret history of the America's greatest wrestling family, the Sacklers. Most of that title is... Very accurate and true. They, they are basically the precursors of Vix McMahon. That's what I've gotten from the book. So we continue talking about this horrible family, the Sacklers. Um, I guess if the first third, uh, the patriarch, was was focused on Arthur Sackler... I guess we would say this second part is m- focused on Richard Sackler, if anybody. Yeah, I think. Although most it, of it, 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 there's a lot to talk about here that's not directly related to him, I guess, too. But yeah, he's the main I figure, I guess, um, at least of the Sackler clan. <laughs> he's the main figure. He's like, I mean, there's even a chapter. I think the second chapter in book two's um, heir apparent or heir apparent. It's obviously Richard, even though I think uh, Kathy is a bit upset about that. Yes, Kathy. uh, There's a lot of names in this book. So Richard Sackler is the son, I believe probably eldest son, of Mortimer Sackler of the the original Sackler trilogy. He's got to kill the corpse of Arthur that it's not one of his sons. Yeah, did it's Arthur have heir. Arthur had kids, right? Yeah, he did. They were daughters. I think. I think Kath, Kathy was one of the kids of his. See, that's what I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there are three original brothers. We'll call them the first generation: Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond. Raymond. It's a real East of Eden story so far. And you know what? I just realized I've already made a mistake. <laughs> What? Richard Sackler, the second generation Sackler, the guy who's the focus of this part of the book, he's the son of Raymond Sackler, I believe. Okay. Yes. Um, Raymond was the fun-loving playboy who traveled across the globe. He was I, eventually knighted by the queen herself. Was that Raymond or was that Mortimer? <laughs> They were both knighted. I can't remember which one was. And I think first. Mortimer was more of the like the traveling guy. In any case, it doesn't really fucking matter. <laughs> These are all just rich people, okay? Rich assholes. And 
Richard Sackler is um, who we kind of open up talking about with in uh, part two of this book. Um, I don't know. In my notes here, I've got like chapters 11 to 13 boiled down to like basically <laughs> um, describing like the, the who Richard Sackler was, like his personality. He's kind of an odd guy. He seems to be an Elon Musk type. Speak on that. <laughs> you know, super rich. Ends up going to like a nice school, smart kid, awkward, no friends. The one friend he does make, he ends up like pissing off because like he uh, doesn't understand that maybe people get weirded out when you're like paying for all their shit and kind of, you know, treating them with no empathy. Right. Deal. I just imagine that's a bit what uh, Elon Musk was like. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. Yeah. So yeah, it, it kind of it, it kind of uh, the book goes describes Richard Sackler sort of through the the eyes of this f- college friend of his whose name. Uh, oh, here we go. Richard Capit 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 um, Capit Cabot Capit Whatever. Cabot. <laughs> um, they they go on a quest to learn about the male organism. Organ or, orgasm? Was it loose? Was it male was it? only? I'm sure it was actually female and male. <laughs> it was they, were, they were looking for the truth of the elusive female or orgasm. They even took a. They even took their broad along, their bird. <laughs> yeah, they seem to be some like sort of love triangle tension going on there as well with um, R- Richard's girlfriend and then this. Cap it. They're, they're fucking rich people. See, you know what? This is even harder. Fucking each other is like threesomes. This is even time. harder to talk about because they're both named fucking Richard. Um, in any case, Richard Sackler, Sackler and is is very detached from reality in a in the way that I guess maybe a lot of extremely wealthy heirs are. Um, like money is just, they think it's a described in the book is like money is like air to him, you know, it has like no consequence. Sure. And, um, he did, s- there was some like event that made him and this other Richard, this friend of his, um, part ways. But what was that? I can't really remember now. Uh, there was just, so they lived together. They ended up being college roommates and, um, Richard Sackler suggested them be college roommates and he was talking to Capalt and was like, Hey, why don't we be roommates and uh, come check out a place. I have a place in New York. We can live there together. And he takes Capalt to the place and it's like fucking magnificent with like expensive furniture, big, like a, like a mini castle basically. And Capalt's like, hell yeah, I want to live here. Awesome. So I think they, they um, just, they just take the furniture back to their apartment. Apartment, I believe. It seemed like the depart apartment was also described as pretty big for like a college living. Oh yeah, it anyway. was like in, it was his family's like property, and they just walked in. And we're like, yeah, we'll take some of this, some of that. Yeah, I remember. That Anyways, part. they lived together for a while. They went on their misadventures together. They learned about sex together. Capalt was made to feel small because you know he was uh, saving his virginity for God or whatever. You know, he was shy, studious not ready to have sex yet and uh Sackley thought that was fucking dumb oh right yeah he liked he he was like uh yeah that was the whole thing about like the Sackler men being all very like sex crazed and then okay. passing it on to Richard who was like when you can afford the best sex workers from the age of five <laughs> how wouldn't you be I think they're you I, just get sick of sex by that point I, I want to say it's part of the um we talked about it with Arthur Sackler, like his whole thing was all about conquest, whether it was with, yeah. with business or sex or whatever. And Richard um, was not much different from his uncle in that way. Um, yeah, Richard had it too. I think the, the Richards, the way they fell out is um, the first like sort of like screw in their the screw slipping out and they're falling out or whatever um, was uh, Richard setting a, uh, it was, 
was Richard Sackler setting Little Rich up on a um, I'm, I'm, his cousin. I, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Little Rich isn't rich like Richard Sackler. <laughs> yeah. It's got a great singing voice, though. Um, and he shows up on this date with the uh, Sackler cousin whose name doesn't matter. She's not a big part of the book. And he picks her up. Shows up at the front door with, you know, a corsage or whatever. And she's like looking around. It's like, where's your car? And he points at the bus and she's like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and turns her nose up and is like, makes fun of him. Like, a bus? Are you kidding? I'm a sackler. And instead of Little Rich being like, you know, a man and uh, doing the manly thing and saying like, you're fucking sackler. Where's your car? I'll drive. <laughs> He just slumps his shoulders down. He was and, humiliated. Uh, and walks home. And then, I don't know how many months later, I think it happens months later, there's a day where there's a pile of dirty dishes at the Richard Haas home. And the two Richards are looking at him. And Kapal's just sick of it. He's like, I don't fucking want to wash these dishes. And he starts screaming at Rich Sackler. He's like, you're so rich. Why don't you buy as a fucking maid? Why do I always have to be made to wash these dishes? And then Rich Sack was like, sure, I'll buy us a maid. And that pissed him off even more. He was like, oh, you just got everything. And he realized that maybe they were incompatible as people because their social classes were so uh, astronomically different. Yeah. And um, I found I found the part now here in the book, too, where um, after the humiliating like date event, um, with the cousin who is actually just not named. It just says one of his cousins, um, cousin Sackler, cousin yeah. Sackler. Um, let's, let's call him poor Richard, poor Richard, poor Richard, <laughs> poor Richard was humiliated. And it quote, he felt as if Richard Sackler should have known that, uh, known that he didn't have a car. Uh, and that, the the bus would be a non-starter for the cousin, but it simply never occurred to him. So, like, the point is, is that poor Richard, like, gradually starts to see that rich Richard <laughs> is uh, Richard Sackler, has like basically like no empathy and is very he's like he says he politely puts it as like being very thoughtless. Um, for such a smart guy, he can be quite thoughtless, something like that. Anyway, we don't need to dwell on like his character too much. I mean, a lot more of his character gets revealed just in the the later events I mean, of the book anyway, but they were obviously a living, breathing version of the Chad meme. There was Richard King, Sackler. There was King Chad Sackler <laughs> and poor Chad Richard. I mean, he's kind of a nerd too though, like you said, like he didn't he or or like a social misfit like he didn't like you said he didn't really have friends he didn't empathize with people he didn't need friends he knew he was better than everyone else yeah he was and really into being like a self-important intellectual and like that's and all he that, cared about was fucking yeah a a fuck crazy self-important intellectual much like he's like more seems more similar to arthur maybe maybe there was some like uh some some weird thing where like uh, I mean, Arthur didn't want to take responsibility for the, the, the Would kid. you be surprised if Arthur had had sex with all his brother's wives? No, I guess not. So yeah, maybe his real dad was Arthur. We're really getting to the bottom of something here. Yeah. <laughs> That's their book. We're going to write the secret love life of Arthur Sackler and get sued to oblivion by the Sackler family for defamation. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Got to get our name on the map somehow. Um, so I think that basically, and then yes, they do this. They also did this weird, like, I don't even think you call it a study. I actually found it the part, the part of this book kind of boring, surprisingly yeah, boring. Mean, where they're like, it because it was just, it was just nonsense. It was just like you didn't like the humanizing of uh, Richard Sackler. I don't know if it did humanize him. It just made him seem like a fucking idiot. Actually, <laughs> like. Anyway, they, they, they were like, we're going to figure out, like, the physiology of the orgasm or, or something like that. And, like, they didn't figure anything out. They didn't do any studies. They're not scientists either. Like, they're just, they're just, like, college students sticking around and, like, talking to other scientists, like. 
Yeah, I mean, the other big scientists, not other scientists. The other big part of the first section is uh, the death of author does happen in this section. And there's the big inheritance war among the family. And there's like a ton of fallout with like the three Y or the two wives because Marietta is just like gone by that point. But Jillian and uh, Elsa and uh, all the family hates uh, Jillian because she's like the same age as author's kids. And there's like the one funny moment where I, I think it was Calf Sackler's like the Ming bed's mine, Ming bed that belongs to me. And then like her reasoning for why the Ming bed belongs to her is because she had took a boy there when she was 14. Yeah. And devoured him like a black widow does its mate. <laughs> um, yeah. Cat, Kath, Kathy, Kath, Kathy. Um, Kathy spelled in a way I've never seen Kathy spelled before. Um, yeah, that, I mean, I really like this second section. I w- I'll say right now, I like it a lot more than the first section, but the, the, uh, the chapter on the inheritance stuff, I, it kind of made my eyes glaze over after a little bit. Yeah. Cause I think the inheritance stuff's mainly there to introduce us to Richard and Kathy, actually, who I think are the two, like biggest Sackler names for different reasons. Yeah, they have the rest of of it. They have kind of their own like rivalry and stuff as well. I mean I guess what it what it shows obviously is that this family, as much as they kind of do stick together, they will throw each other under the bus um really easily. Because I mean I don't want to even go into the details of it, but the whole chapter on the inheritance thing was just like alliances and betrayals left and right. It was just like, yeah. oh, God, this is fucking yeah. annoying. <laughs> Imagine had the uh, original four musketeers, the Sackler three and their friend. I don't remember who the fourth guy was. Ibanez, I think. Um, had they just um, went with their original plan and let all of their money disperse into the Commonwealth and left their children with like a million dollars each. All this that would have been commie nonsense. <laughs> it would have been. So what happens in the second half? I see the God of Dreams enters. It's kind of cool that they went on a fantasy direction like that. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, actually, um, I wanted to read from that chapter. That's chapter 14, right? Yeah. Um, the ticking clock? Yeah. Or 15 is the God of Dreams. That's the one about opium. Okay. So actually, sorry, I didn't, uh, wait, no, no, I said 11 to 13. So yeah, so chapter 14, ticking clock, that's important. Um, it, um, it, the ticking clock refers to the patent process and, um, I, I marked that I wanted to just read something from there, but fuck, yeah, we talked about that a bit in the, in the last episode. And I think I brought up the Disney thing, and I think this chapter cleared something up for me where uh, I kind of realized uh, what Disney, the way Disney gets away with its stuff is copyright and not so much patent. Oh, okay. Anyways, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not 100% sure how all that stuff works. You're going to talk about M. Cotton's patent running out in 1997, and they have to... M. Cotton, better known as Purple Poppers, Canada's drug of choice... In the nineties, M- MS MS morphine MS sulfate. Kind. I always just preferred the pure morphine kind. I don't like the sulfate part. Too sulfatey. I guess yes. The whole point is that they're racing against the clock to find a new drug um, because they had they have this drug. That is a time release morphine pill, MS Contin, and its its patent is going to run out in ninety seven. You said, or ninety six, ninety seven. Okay, and um, it talks about how much Arthur Sackler hated like the whole concept of generic generic medicines. Um, Sure, eats into his money. Yeah, he he would have definitely been a um, keep the vaccines privatized guy if he were around today. Um, Uh, All the pharmaceuticals, they're doing this. That's why they do it. They don't want to lose out on money. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then so the, the and then the, they have the what they call the patent cliff, which is just when your patent runs out and all the uh, competing generics come in, you see your sales just drop like a cliff. And yeah. um I I also I just I I had a thought of like and I think I don't know if we talked about this last time, but I think it's just amazing in in American society the way that it is these days with the dominance of corporations it's amazing that like pharma like big pharma lobbying hasn't secured like infinite patents or or at least longer ones than 20 years like i'm just i'm just so i'm just honestly shocked that they haven't i mean they've maybe tried think- and failed or maybe it's ultimately not even so they I might be wrong about this, but um, I think they've tried before. I think they've constantly failed on this. What they are allowed to do is keep near infinite copyright. So like they can always sell the drug under the name MS Cotton, but after a certain period of time, other people are allowed to use the patent because that's part of how the patent systems work, just so they can keep advancing stuff. Yeah, but that's what just eats into their profits, That's and yeah. that's all they care about, really. But I imagine... This is something I'd have to look up, but one of the big things that I hate about the tech industry, and I don't know how much you about, know about this, is like patent mills in the tech industry, where a company like IBM or Microsoft goes out and basically patents ideals of things they haven't made yet, just so that when someone does make it, they can say, oh, wait, we have the patent for that. So even though you made it and did all the legwork, we actually own it. Yeah, you can just like patent a concept. So I do imagine these drug companies do the same thing. Well, yeah, and what they do is they just like they in the lab they just like move move molecules around to like slightly change a substance. So then it's technically different, even though it basically has the same effect. And then they can say, "Oh, we get a new patent for this." No. And yeah, there's there, I, there's a whole lot of problems with like um just the the patenting system, I guess, like patenting like life forms like organic life forms and like um genetically engineered yeah life is is patentable now basically not Um, not to be all tech bro because generally i'm not a big big fan of them though i do kind of agree with the whole coalition of like you know open source right like open source software where um where it's all shared software and the big deal with it is um it's made under the open source uh, license. And that means that if you create it, you have to share all the code for it and other people can be on top of it or even fork off of it and make their own project. I often think that um, if we use that system for everything instead of the patent system, the world would be a lot better off. Well, yeah. I mean, like that's, that's kind of the, uh, the socialist ideal, I guess, to put it bluntly, isn't it? I mean, it is to some degree. Um, <clears throat> share your it's work. Sh- sharing. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just... share share your goddamn work. Imagine where we would get with these fuck. I bet we would have got the vaccines out much quicker if each of these companies had. Well, I guess they were sharing their work. Mm, the sort of. They were sharing their work among the three companies who were like, as long as we get these out first, the government's giving us a lot of money to get this uh, vaccine made as quick as possible. Yeah, the sharing stopped there though. Yeah. In a way, but um, that's another thing. <laughs> I know, I know. If I go off on that direction, we'll never come back. Um, so actually, this chapter fourteen had has a lot more than just the stuff about the patent uh, cliff and the uh, ticking ticking yeah, clock. It was, um, it was actually kind of crazy, even in this first page, to hear about how they um how they would do the negative articles on like generics. Like they had that schizophrenic walled on weak generic describing how all hell broke loose at that like veterans hospital. Yeah. Um, that's the part I wanted like, to read actually. And I'm glad you found it. Cause I, just I can't find up. it. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Arthur Sackler doing um, just uh, yeah. It, it, it was so oh, about Thorazine. So like uh, he, Arthur Sackler, Shit, we can't escape the old man. Um, but anyway, Arthur Sackler back in the day, before even before he made all his money with Valium and Librium, he was making he was marketing Thorazine for Pfizer, um, which is like a really powerful tranquilizer, like an antipsychotic. And yeah, he Never went tried he, that one. he went on a negative marketing campaign that like 
you just said um turned out to they, be they made up false, like right? a, they made up completely false stories about like uh mentally ill patients like uh i don't know running amok in like psychiatric wards because of uh bad generic versions of of thorazine and it was all like proven to be completely false and you know of course like didn't stop arthur zackler from continuing to build this like empire of pain Um, yeah i mean obviously they're not going to do this again though they wouldn't continue to lie and get away with it (laughs) history repeats itself so much with richard sackler and arthur sackler Um, i mean author like created the playbook as far as i can tell yeah, I mean or, a lot there's 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 so much there's so many parallels between Arthur Sackler's like um making huge amounts of money off of tranquilizers like Valium and then um Richard Sackler hitting the jackpot with uh, oxy, oxycotton. Yeah. Um which we'll probably like elaborate more on. And Richard's even worse because I think author in a weird way probably had more empathy than Richard just because he had grown up slightly normal. Yeah. He grew, well, he grew up poor. Like he actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was still like an awful person and that's something we um, slid over, but there was some really creepy detail about Arthur Sackler and his daughter. Um, oh yeah. I Now I when can't even like, remember exactly what it was, but they were at some like gala event. I don't fucking know. I just want to call it a gala event. And uh, all of his friends were like going up to him and he's like introducing her as his daughter and his friends are like, sure, sure thing. Your daughter, that's what you're calling her. And then he said that he stopped correcting them and just enjoyed the fantasy or something like that. It made me think of Trump and Ivanka so much. Yeah, I guess that's In my head, that was like the thought because I just always imagine that's how Trump treats Ivanka. I mean, Trump did uh, say lots of weird shit publicly about his daughter. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that's fucked up. But I just brought that up because Arthur uh, Arthur Sackler is still a bad person, even if he may be. If I, mean, I don't know, it's like it's just like old money versus new money. Like who, who his, who's what what makes for a worse person? And it's probably old money. His wife seemed to be cool with the fact. I mean, authors' wives seem to be cool with the fact that he cheated on all of them. Um, but that's kind of a typical like rich people they were thing. I feel like just though. cool because they had a shit ton of money. That's what I'm saying. I think How that's like a, t- be cool? a typical like ultra rich. Right. We'll like, be fine. Scenario. Well, no, because then they also know like, oh, okay, hey, great. Like, if we get divorced, I can hold that over their head. You know, like yeah. Anyway, um, so <laughs> we got. We read, we read, we read uh, chapters eleven to twenty. Um, by the way, and uh, yeah, that's the, the so, book two. So continuing in chapter fourteen, um, the author starts talking about how there's this kind of epidemic of pain. Um, it's kind of like this change in society in a way, in culture, where where physicians are worrying more about how patients feel. Right. And this is this is talked about a really interesting way in the documentary, which I'll just remind everybody again, there's a kind of a companion documentary that I would say, yeah, I mean, it totally goes along with this book. And oddly, I don't think all of this is wrong. Like, I do think it's important to think about pain and people do suffer pain that they probably don't have to. Yeah, of course. Um, the documentary is the, what is it? The Crime of the Century. Of the century. And yeah, there was a psychiatrist, I don't remember her name, but she talks about it in a really interesting way about how like in the past, even when like um like oxycodone was first invented, like in Germany, whenever, um, and all and I mean opium's been used forever. Um, but like there were doctors who were against the idea of like using pain relief and painkillers because they thought that it like impeded the healing process and stuff, which I don't agree with that either that's like the other extreme i don't but, agree with it but, but there are times in my head that i'm like you know people should just accept suffering a little more but that could just be my my shitty upbringing no i i i lean that way too i think like and and that's what this psychiatrist kind of talks about is she says like contrast that with now we're like pain like 
any sense of pain or discomfort is like, it's like immediately like you must rid yourself of it. Um, which, I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm not that way. I'm totally that way. <laughs> like, I don't want to sure. be uncomfortable, like, you know. Um, but it humans haven't always been this way, I guess, is what I'm Sure. I, I see people in, like, you know, full-on suits in the hot, humid Korean summer occasionally. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> That's do your first not, thought. Of do they not care at all about being comfortable? Enduring I, pain. <laughs> as As I walk around in my... In my short shorts, in my short t-shirt, <laughs> belly button out. Baby, ah, Daisy Dukes on the way to teach class. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like this is obviously important to to the overall story of 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 Oxycontin and, and the opioid epidemic is like what starts off with good intentions, like yes, like you said, doctors want wanting to focus on like pain relief pain management and stuff um it turns into this profit seeking basically like the profit motive like distorts this this kind of like real concern and like these laudable like goals and like warps them and then and then it becomes not really about pain management at all i mean it just becomes about like hooking people and like take extracting as much um profit as possible um so in response to this this like movement of 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 pain treatment this is when so so we still haven't really gotten to oxycontin yet so this is the invention of ms content which is the morphine pill um that has the the revolutionary slow release um technology which is just like a coating that goes over the pill that like dissolves slower so like it releases the drug slowly into your body what they put on my fucking adderall to ruin it yeah they see that you know i thought about this so like um of course these pills start to be abused and people get addicted to them as well because it's fucking morphine it's a powerful opiate um opioid opiate what's the difference anyway um is opioid is synthetic i thought they were the same thing just like different ways of saying it i could be wrong I, I, I don't know but i mean i guess they're all sort of synthetic they're all processed anyway the uh like people who want to get high off these drugs figure out a way like so they were called what purple peelers in canada oh yeah i said purple poppers earlier but yeah purple peelers <laughs> Because they, had the they were purple, peel the and, purple like time release part off before they yeah, melted it. You could down just and peel, it up. peel it off, and then yeah, like crush the pill and shoot it or snort it or whatever. And um, it did remind me of <laughs> angrily <laughs> emptying out a pill of time release Adderall. Um, well, the problem with time release Adderall, you get in there, and then each of the little capsules in there are also. Well, that's what I'm. That's what I'm getting at. Is <laughs> I remember trying to crush those once and being furious <laughs> they wouldn't be crushed. So I'm saying that technology really worked. I don't think there's any way to get around that. Yeah. So I'm saying what I'm getting at is like oxy. Uh, Oxycontin could have the same kind of technology if they really if they really cared about that. I imagine it is the same technology. It, it's now. not though. It's not because it's you not. you can't peel you you can like that's true. People can they said that people can like lick off the coating or like peel or peel it. It was being peeled off of these morphine pills, and I assume it's the and I I'm pretty sure it's the same exact time release technology on the oxycontin. It is. So they say in the book it is, and I mean there it, it there wouldn't be the epidemic the way that it is if you if you couldn't easily get around that because you couldn't shoot it then. There might still be though. I mean, it's not in ticking clock, but some people think that a lot of the addiction problems actually come from the uh, the fact that oxycotton. Th this will be brought up later, but the fact that oxycotton was marketed as a twelve hour drug, as that it should have effects for twelve hours, but. Um, study after study, patient after patient would find that the effects actually wear off after eight hours, which gives them a valley um, where they have enough time to experience withdrawal syndromes, which often made them want to take more than the two pills a day that they were prescribed. So then their doctors would start prescribing them three a day. Well, 
that was actually the doctors who did that probably helped their patients. What a lot of doctors would do, they'd be like, oh no, don't take three a day. What you need is a higher two day of those. And, uh, oh, right. and Purdue wanted that because, well, they want a minute, but they knew, they knew that they should be prescribed it as a three day day pill. They'd actually like, there's been studies done. It would have been less addictive had they just done three smaller doses during the day because mm-hmm. of the way the timing worked. But having the 12 hour window give the patient enough time to actually feel withdrawal centers every day, which makes you more likely to want to go and do more and more because you're trying to self-correct. And the heavier, like the higher concentrated dose doesn't necessarily last longer. It just gets you yeah, it's higher. Gonna wear off. Yeah. It just wears off at the same rate. So yeah. You're, you're, still so you're just wear getting, great hours. you're getting, you're getting the buzz, the, uh, the buzz. I mean, that's putting it lightly, but like, that's the way that these the sales reps would talk about Oxycontin is like, it's buzz free. Like people don't get high off this stuff. It's like you're selling fucking pure heroin. Like that's yeah. what that's what people keep forgetting is like no no no. Not I'm sorry, not pure heroin. No, they're heroin. selling strong heroin. It's tw- what is it, twice as strong as heroin is I forget exactly what it what the numbers were now, but I like to think of it as weaker than fentanyl. <laughs> right. You're an optimist. <laughs> um. Anyway, where was I going with that? I was about to start t- telling stories about me doing speed. No. Um. Anyway, us. we're drug free. <laughs> Quite literally these days. I mean, I'll just I'll just say like I've done oxycontin a couple of times, maybe twice, and I just don't. I didn't like it. I really didn't like painkillers in general. Yeah, they were never for me. I don't like the... uh, I've also... I've tried just about everything. I also did not... One time I did it... Was it for me? One time I took took a pill. I don't know what milligram it was, but I remember I had to pay like $20 for it. And I was like, what the fuck? Why is this so expensive? They were fucking expensive, dude. Well, they say it's a dollar per milligram is like the street value. Or at least it was at one point. My friend selling them for sixty dollars a pill. Jesus, he was, he was. We worked construction together, and he got prescribed them. And he, uh, he'd actually had some uh, family issues with it, and just didn't want them. But he had no, uh, no qualms, just palming them off. He's like, yeah, we sell for sixty dollars a pill. I mean, I don't know, people. I'll need just money. eat bottles of aspirin to, you know, feel better. So the one time I remember doing it, like, uh, I just like took it like like orally and like yeah i don't have any memory of like even really feeling good honestly i just like threw up like after like hours later i threw up um are you drinking a lot or something no i wasn't drinking at all i was just like i was just i just didn't enjoy it i don't like the effects but like i um i guess what i'm saying is i guess maybe i'm lucky in that way because it just didn't it does that doesn't appeal to me. It just made me feel like, I mean, I was like with friends and like, it didn't make me want to like be talk to anybody. And I don't know. It's obviously, it's not a social drug. Um, and it's, so it just, it just kind of, de- it was like a depressing experience in a weird way. But then I did yeah. it after that another time, just cause you know, I'm, I I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a druggie and, um, <laughs> or I especially was back then. And I did it with like a friend in college and we were just like snorting it. Even though the guy who sold us the pills was like explicitly like, don't crush this, don't snort it. And we we're like, yeah, whatever, man. And uh, that I also remember having zero fun at all. It was just like just sitting, sitting on a couch, like with like a blank head. But um, that's what some people want, though. I guess. I mean, I, I, I get the appeal of like wanting to like get out of your mind, but like, I don't know. I never, I never got that like sort of like that body rush or whatever that people talk about with these drugs either. But I think that's for, all for the best. Um, yeah, I do too. I mean, yeah, I, I don't. They're not for me either, from my my experiences. And I, they probably I, shouldn't I prefer, be for most people. From <laughs> I prefer old fashioned drugs like LSD because I do like to get out of my head. I mean, that is old fashioned compared to oxycodone. Wait, no, it's not. Oxycodone's first, but not Oxycontin. Yes. With its specific patent. Okay. Um, so, 
some things that we'll see that happen with Oxycontin happened with MS Contin as well. Like they, their whole thing was they wanted to get around the limits of like, this is only a cancer drug or this is a drug for end of life. Which they had a hard time doing with MS Cotton. I don't because think they of the ever word successfully did it. Yeah. Because people associated the word morphine with like their grandparents like dying in a hospital bed. And uh, this fucking drug was just morphine. It was pure morphine. Yeah, time released morphine. And um, so they start, Richard Sackler starts uh, like furiously working on um, a new drug that's going to be basically like MS cotton, but you know, a million times better and more profitable. But he couldn't come up with a, um, with an ideal of how to do it. It was actually his cousin, Kathy, um, Kathy Sackler, who suggested oxycodone. Yeah, and apparently they argued about that. They'll end up arguing about that later down the and down the road. Later, like, Richard will take all the credit. It was my idea. It was my idea. They're like, this is like in the midst of like the height of the opium uh, opioid crisis. They're like, I thought of it first. This is fucking rich brats. Um. So yeah, that's basically and how how that started to happen. Uh, the the invention of oxycotton. Um, and they I were guess, inventing it for, I mean, well, the, basically the reason they furiously worked on it, like, uh, their lawyer, I think it was their lawyer, Bob Kaiko. He was the lawyer, right? One of the lawyers, one of the many lawyers. He had sent a memo to Richard in 1990. that was like, MS cotton may eventually face such serious generic competition that other controlled release opioids must be considered. And that's right. cause, uh, Purdue was worried about losing the monopoly on its flagship painkiller. And that's when, like, Kath and Richard came, whichever came up. Kath says she came up. Kathy, Kathy, Kath, Kath, Cat. That's when Cat came up with, hey, have you heard of oxycodone? It's like morphine, only stronger, which makes me want to just do one aside. All these doctors are fucking terrified of prescribing MS uh, cotton, the morphine one, for, you know, pain outside of like cancer or like, before death pain mm -hmm. and they're doctors they're they're motherfucking doctors they must know that okay codeine is just stronger morphine but somehow they let themselves be convinced you mean oxycodone right yeah oxycodone okay some somehow they let themselves be convinced that oh yeah this one yeah it's it should be fine even though the other one that we were scared of yeah so that's we, that's that's an interesting part that we're yeah, that's where we are in the book. Um, like they did, um, there was some sort of study or you know, like um, poll or whatever done, and like they found that most doctors, for whatever reason in their mind, considered oxycodone to be weaker than morphine, even though it's so, so much stronger, like a here, lot stronger. Here, personally, I think, in, even with like. I've never had problems with uh, oxycodone or oxycontin, but I've had family members who have, and it's, it's affected my life negatively. But I think for a long time, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that uh, morph. I used for a long time, I thought morphine was the strongest of strong because I do think it has that reputation just from like film and books and other stuff that I've read and grown up with. Well, yeah, because you you think about like people shooting up, like back in the day. You think of people on the street, like doing heroin, and then oxycontin. Oh, that's a pill in a bottle from a guy in a white coat. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean, I I had that same misinformed idea in my mind too. For some reason, even like, at, even though like it's not like I was thinking about those drugs all the time, but just like if someone would have asked me which do you think is like stronger, I would have definitely had the same. But the thing is. We weren't doctors. <laughs> we weren't yeah. even like we weren't even adults yet, really. Um, so, like, I mean, this is this is gonna bring up like the whole thing about like how easily these doctors are either duped or are just like complicit in in um, lying to their patients and killing their patients, basically. Um, but yeah, it kind of boggles my mind that the doctors don't understand that. It's a, it's not like oxycodone was a new drug. Oxycodone had been synthesized in like the 1800s by some German chemist. Like yeah. you'd think they would know. <laughs> I think they did. Well, 
But they but they said like they just said like their impression or whatever. They were like it's oh yeah, it's weaker than morphine. Um, I do think that the the FDA put an approval on it. But this is before that, by the That's way. That's true. This is before OxyContin is even in existence yet. This because this is this is when they're getting close to releasing it, but like this is when they're still doing all the the research and development and stuff. And um so the the important part was is that Purdue Pharma, the the company, the Sackler company that makes these drugs, um just to reiterate they find out that, oh, doctors have this misapprehension. And there's emails showing, the internal emails of them saying, well, here's what we do. We run with that. We don't, we're not going to try to correct that, basically. We're going to use their ignorance to our advantage and, and tell them, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's non-abusable. It's non-addictive. Only, well, only 1% of people can get addicted to it. But basically, it's like, you know, there's no limit on how much you can even take, which is the most insane thing. Yeah. They literally said that in like the official like pamphlets and literature and stuff. It's like there's no limit, really. Like that's just saying like overdose is impossible. Like what do you mean? It's um, it's completely insane. And so like the big push with oxycodone. So they they're simultaneously trying to do two things. They're trying to get FDA approval at like rapid speed. Um, like usually it takes, I don't know how many years to like, four or for, five. like four or five years after you submit to the FDA to get your drug approved. It took them 11 months, I believe. Well, yeah, they skirted around it because what they ended up doing is since, uh, I think oxycodone was already like, uh, approved for like it, end of life care. It was in per- Percocet and Percodan, yeah, and- which was mixed with like, um, acetaminophen and stuff. Exactly. And their whole thing was, oh, our drug's better because it's pure oxycodone. Yep. Um, I'm sorry, you um, were saying. They got around it because they eventually, they started just like pushing it out there. Because like, well, it's already approved because other people are using this stuff. And we're just going to put the time release capsule on it. The thing that actually has to be approved. The only difference is that we have a time release capsule. We got to make the distinction, though, here between the, the morphine pill is the one that they pushed out before they got FDA approval. Okay. Which was an insane thing by itself that I guess I, 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 yeah, I forgot about that, but um, yeah, they just went ahead. Like that's how, that's like how reckless and like entitled, like these rich fucks are. <laughs> like, well, I think a lot of rich fucks up are under the, uh, do it now. Apologize later if we have to, but really, we're never going to apologize. For it's sure. just amazing that you can have a company that pushes morphine without approval, and like there, and then so then the the FDA finds out, and they're like, "Hey, you can't be doing this." And and the way they get around that is they get they like some the ex, they get some experts and doctors to testify and say, "Well, our patients really rely on this on this medicine." And if you if you make them recall it, our patients are gonna like you know die basically. Like they need their morphine. They're gonna go. They said like they're gonna go into like crazy withdrawals if you take away this medicine. And the FDA was like, "All right, fine. You, your drug's like magically approved now." Or so, I mean, they just let them continue selling it. Okay, but that's okay. So that's all pre oxy cotton. Okay. And the uh, chapter ends. I do like how the chapter ends because it kind of gets into the crux of what the Sacklers' like main goal becomes. But it's like if Purdue wanted to market a powerful opioid like OxyContin for less acute, more persistent types of pain, because that's the ideal. They don't want it to just be end of life. They want it to be for like you know you have a headache, take an OxyContin. Stub your toe, take an Oxy. Yeah. One challenge would be the perception among physicians that opioids could be very addictive. If Oxycontin was going to achieve its full commercial potential, the Sacklers of Purdue would have to undo that perception, which is where they started pouring all their money into, is to change the outlook, to make people like us where we have that outlook for morphine, but somehow even me and you, I mean, now we have it for Oxycontin, but we didn't for a long time. I know I didn't. I I get how people were fooled. They poured a ton of money into fooling us. Yeah, it was a huge like disinformation campaign, basically, and uh there's like historic historical parallels that are interesting too, because like, so when people started using morphine um, 
I don't know, like turn of the century or whatever. And they got addicted and it was like, oh, this is terrible. And then heroin got invented and they used heroin to get people off of morphine. Yeah. And then, and then, so then like maybe the parallel to that would be the, the opioids like Percocet and Percodan, which have this, are, it's just oxycodone with Tylenol together and at lower doses of oxycodone. Um, and this didn't have the time release function. So OxyContin is as seen as a as a great alternative to those. And and the other thing is they 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 stab their own product in the back as well with OxyContin. They say OxyContin is even is superior to our other drug, um, MS Cotton, the morphine one. They like they just they throw it, it under the bus. And, yeah, because um, they because they only had like a year left on the path. Yes, yeah, so they, they didn't wanted care. to like beat it. They wanted to beat the uh, cliff of generics. They wanted like it also kind of fucked over all the generic makers who were going to push out generic things because they're like, let's just make it obsolete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think prescription morphine uh, is, is was ever, has been in vogue at least not for the last twenty something years. Um, stronger stuff now. Now you just take a fit in a lollipop. Right, Jesus. Um, so the other like huge part of this this story is that they they just bribe an FD like the, this guy at the FDA who's like the one guy standing between them and getting their drug approved, and not just approved, but it approved in the way that they wanted approved, meaning that they have their um, their insert for the drug, which is just full of completely bogus like unscientific, uh, untested claims like this drug's not addictive. <laughs> like it's pure opium, but it's not addictive, you know? Um, and yes, this guy was a uh, Curtis Wright. Um, he worked for the FDA and there's just, there's just I mean, reasons. He's an upright of- fellow, right? He had no reason no reason to lie about this. So they, there's just there's reams of evidence of of how he how um, Purdue like collaborated with him. Like they just like sat down and wrote like they wrote the like the report that yeah, he they, would be submitting to the FDA. Like they got their him. team of technical writers to be like, hey, yeah, they like pour, pour, right. pour it over every word, of course, and like lawyers and shit. And um, but then so <laughs> of course, like the drug gets approved. Um. Curtis Wright, the FDA guy, uh, a year after uh, oxycodone's approved, he quits his job at the FDA, takes a job at Purdue, and earns four hundred thousand dollars a year to do, like do nothing. It's just like the most blatant, like bu- like being bought um, situation, you know. Yep. And this this happens with a bunch of people um, throughout this story. Um, it even happens with people that were like on a crusade against Purdue. Do you remember the the part? It comes up later. There was a guy. There was, he was like maybe the district attorney in Maine, I think, or he was like he was either an attorney or a politician. I can't remember in Maine because like there was like a a big like um explosion of like uh, opioid use in Maine, and um, he wrote this like really damning like letter that he sent it out to like I don't know thousands and thousands of doctors in the state. Like just warning them about this about oxycodone, or sorry, oxy, yeah. oxycotton, and that same guy, like a little while after that, ends up getting a job at Purdue and yeah, defending was- them in court. He like wrote a letter saying that um, one of their like one of their most terrible yeah. people that worked for them that we're going to talk about in a second here. Oh, he's a great he's a great man. He doesn't deserve to be in any trouble. He he referred to oxycotton as like a plague of locust or whatever. Um just or the black plague. Like it was like America's plague. And then Purdue got poached him because that's what they did. One of their biggest tactics was to poach the pe- their biggest criticizers cuz like if you can't beat them, um poach them, <laughs> pay them off. Yeah. Give them a lot of money. Like put them on your team. Yeah, yeah, and this this that happened a lot. Um, then the next chap the next chapter was pretty harrowing. It's like a little shorter, but it's like it's about uh, this we- explosion. Oh, okay, we're just finishing up. God of Dreams. Then, um, yeah, I mean, wait. I think it, it it ends just with like the drug gets approved, and it it mentions like Curtis Wright getting that that job at Purdue. I think. I mean, I think that that, that 
I mean, I'm just yeah, looking at my right. notes here, but the H bomb. Yeah, chapter sixteen, the H bomb. Um, this chapter is fucking crazy. Yeah, it's re- which it's really well written, also because it doesn't re- it 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 doesn't re- really reveal what's going on like up front, which is an interesting. Um, which is something that maybe we should bring up because I don't think we brought it up, but um. In the ticking clock chapter, they mention a company, NAP, and that's a company that, uh, a chemical company that um, I think Purdue had just like literally bought, or they were a giant stakeholder in, but they were making most of the medicines for Purdue. NAP this was this, NAPP, NAP? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is, uh, this is about that, NAP that, facilities. That's what this place is. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, like, the chapter opens, like, from the perspective of this particular individual, um, Calixto? I'm not really Calixto. sure. Calixto. I um, think that's right. And, I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it just talks about how he wakes up and he's been, like, working, like, overtime, like, crazy at this chemical plant that he works at and i think yeah because he has a three-month-old son he's trying to get I think he try, for he, his new son he tries to call in sick and like they just convince him to come in anyway they're like just one more eight hour shift and then you, you're off for two weeks <sighs> it's terrible and um like to just jump to what happens really like there's just this big fuck up because like this this uh this chemical plant factory whatever um they mix chemicals um and what makes this uh this chemical company different than say uh Eastman or DuPont the two big the two big chemical companies well uh, i mean a- I, I don't really know about those guys their hiring practices but like this place like basically hired like um undocumented immigrants and stuff and would like just pay them poorly and um uh, they would hire people that were fired from other jobs right they were known as the place to go if you couldn't get a job anywhere else in that kind of field like if you had fucked up too badly somewhere else and like they just didn't they just cut basically it's it's a classic thing of like a corporation cutting corners and 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 maximizing profit at all costs and it leads to literally blowing up the entire factory um and this poor guy and a few other people um, died and it was like this just this massive um, massive explosion that like polluted the river near it Um, I'll just read a little bit from it here for days the plant smoked homes were damaged a toxic green runoff oozed out of the devastated facility it trickled down Main Street and drained into the Saddle River the pollution fed into the Passaic River sickening waterfowl Thousands of fish went belly up and drifted to shore, lining the riverbank pale and dead. A federal investigation would eventually cite Knapp for a bevy of safety violations and issue a conspicuously modest fine of $127,000. That's so low. Can I talk a bit about Calixto? So the day that um, it is low, and I also want to get back to that, but the day that he gets, you know, when he's trying to call in, but he gets convinced to just go on to work. He gets to work and uh, the night, the night before his shift starts, he's like working morning shift that uh, the smell had started in the plant and the, the foreman, the managers, right? It's no big deal. Just ignore it. But as the uh, night went on, the smell got worse and worse. Uh, some water had leaked into these like chemicals and like some of these chemicals, you're never supposed to get water near them or just like bad shit's going to happen. Yeah. Like a all drop man- of water can like just yeah. create like a massive fireball. Yeah. All the managers are like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And every, I mean, the people there aren't really trained. They're like, eh. Okay, managers probably fine. weren't trained either. Yeah, that that's the sense I got. Yeah. But it had been allowed to like fester all night. And then it had gotten so bad that people knew they had to get out of there. Um, so they start evacuating the plant and it's terrible. But um the manager's like, Well, we can't let this go on. Maybe we'll just like send in a crew of eight or so to uh to clean up in there. The and, you know, if they start just cleaning up the mess, it'll be fine before the whole place catches on fire. So they uh, send the crew in there, and Clixto's about to go get coffee because he's not one of the people chosen. But he notices his friends with like a it's like a sixty year old older man that he's friends with at work, and he's like, oh, he's way too old to be going in there. I'm I'm young, I'll be fine. So he volunteers to go. 
Yeah. And the moment they get into like the uh, mixing facility, that's when like the pressure is just like built to the top and like the whole place goes kaboom. And like this, a giant, like 25 ton canister gets picked up and hurled. Like, I think it said like 40 feet into the air and crushed through a wall or something. Yeah. Yeah. And he was uh, killed instantly because the force was so strong that it just, I mean, it crushed his, it crushed his skull. Yeah. And, um, there was one guy who survived for the for the time for like a little bit, but it was like ninety yeah. percent of his body was burned, and then he died. At, uh, you know, soon after that. That's anyway. even worse. I'm sure that's a much worse fate than yeah. just dying instantly. Um, for better or worse. Um, oh, it's it's fucking horrible. They had like a fire department right beside them, but like uh. Now, much like the rest of Purdue and the Sacklers, like to keep everything uh, off the record. So they like tried to keep it in the house to fix everything instead of calling the fire department. Um, Well, because they knew there was probably like a million safety violations going on. I know a little bit about chemical plants just because like where I grew up in uh, the Tri-Cities, Kingsport, Bristol area. Uh, Eastman's there and Eastman's the world's second largest chemical company, which is one something i grew up knowing but uh, my dad worked there forever and like it's real common for these chemical plants to like be super anal about safety stuff and like reading this chapter like just from talking to my dad who our politics usually don't agree i'm reading this chapter is like oh man there's no way my dad would have ever set foot in this place because it's just like knowing like the type of procedures you'd go through from eastman like basically getting um like sprayed down desanitized etc as you go into work um Mm -hmm. and i had a feeling this place isn't doing it like eastman at all times has like the fire department on call i think they have like a special unit of the like town fire department that and their own private one that comes in for any type of mess like this because like i think that's how these type of places have to be ran because they're super dangerous. And this chapter just gives you the general sense that they do not care at all about any of these precautions. Yeah, this is, I mean, the way this fits into the larger story, we haven't quite said explicitly yet, but like, um, I just wanted to, to tack on that. They got the, uh, very modest fine. I mean, that's, that's nothing. That's, that's, that's pocket lint. Um, but then Worse than that, I feel like, it says prosecutors considered bringing manslaughter charges, but opted not to in the end. Just, you know, no reason. Just, nah, nobody's at fault here. Um, And then what we find out, it's revealed, like, after the whole narrative of the explosion is that... um, well, they what what ends up happening to the to the factory is like the town doesn't just the town doesn't want them to rebuild, right? Is that what happens? Yeah, and and so then a spokesman for the company says, "We will not go where we are not wanted." So they just like leave. They just like let this festering exploded place like they just like leave town. Um, yeah, and this pisses off some of the local journalists. At right, the, uh, the town had a local. Virgin County paper called the record. And I guess their journalists try to decide, figure out who the real identity of the Naps owners are. And they end up finding out they're a family of American tycoons and philanthropists. You mean um, like the Sacklers? Yeah. They have this international spectrum of friends, which include uh, Britain's Princess Diana, Nobel Prize winners, influential entrepreneurs, in general, the upper crust of society. They're not the Rockefellers, they're the Sacklers. I bet they're friends with Henry Kissinger. They got to be. Um, um, I, I just wanted to to read this one part though, it, because it really it really nails like the the kind of the disregard for human life that this 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 whole company slash family has. Um, so after the spokesman says, "We will not go where we're not wanted," it says the spokesman was at pains not to mention any names, but the owners he was referring to were the Sacklers. <laughs> If this were a different company or a different family, there might have been some lip service to prevailing notions of where the buck stops or the finer points of corporate social responsibility or even just an expression of sympathy for the dead. But the Sacklers assiduously distanced themselves not just from any sense of responsibility for the tragedy, but from any connection to it whatsoever. 
The family issued no apologies or condolences. They appeared at no funerals. They made no public statements whatsoever. I'm amazed that the Sacklers never been the president of the United States. They what? They're too secretive, man. They don't want. They don't want to be in politics. They they're they're exactly. They would rather own the politicians. Exactly. They're the one. They want to. They want to be putting the money in the back pocket of the politicians. Um, they're too. They're and they're too snobbish. They're like politics. That's for that's for poor people. Like they think politicians are like poor people. You know. Um, yeah. So um, after the plan explodes and. I mean, I do think this is worth talking about, but the record, the the town paper who tries to figure this out, they do eventually connect it to the Sacklers. And mm-hmm. I know one of their reporters eventually uh, meets Raymond Sackler outside a British consulate on 68th Street. That's what the book says. Mm-hmm. And this is like the day that Raymond's going to be knighted by the queen. And he's trying to ask him about the NAP plan and if he feels any bad thing about it. And Raymond's just like, we've been in this uh, field for 40 odd years. We know what safety is, and we're very concerned with people's lives, all people's lives. And uh, then he's like, do you feel any sense of personal responsibility for this tragedy? And Raymond's like, no, absolutely not. And he's just like busy to go get knighted. They don't fucking care at all about this. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at this section of the book, right, this page right now. Yeah, it, absolutely not. And then he turned and headed into the building to go get knighted. Or no, was it knighted? No, that's not the knighting. Oh, I thought he was getting knighted that day. Oh, no, you're right. right. Uh, yeah, he's getting an honorary knighthood from the queen herself, Miss Elizabeth. In recognition of his record of philanthropic gifts in the arts and the sciences. He was being granted an honorary knighthood by Queen Elizabeth, and the British Consul General was present was to present him with a special medal in a formal ceremony. On the subject of this distinction, Raymond was more forthcoming. See, it's funny. This author's got a subtle sense of dry humor. Yeah. <laughs> like, he doesn't want to talk about all the, about the dead people that his company killed. But when he's talking about himself getting an award, he's like, he just can't can't contain himself. Raymond was more forthcoming, declaring himself deeply moved to be recognized by the queen in this manner. It's an honor, he said. It is. It has a great impact on me. Sell, unlike, sell, sell is the next chapter. <laughs> fucking tragedy. That doesn't have an impact on anyone. Yeah, I know. It's fuck. It's horrible. Um, sell, sell, sell. Um, this is where... This is where Oxycontin really takes off. So this is 1996. Uh, I feel like this really parallels well with the documentary we keep bringing up, Empire of Pain. I it, even think this like brings up some of the exact same like people that interviewed in Empire. It does. Oh, sorry, Crime of Century. It does. Um, I said the documentary Empire of Pain, but I meant the documentary Crime of Century. Yeah, going back and watching it again after reading um, the book. I mean, I haven't read the last third yet but yeah they it's it's interesting to like oh it's like i oh i get it now like it like the names are familiar and then you can like put a face to these people yeah once i finish i plan to watch the documentary all over again um yeah it's it's good it like it just it it they really complement each other really well um it it seems like the documentary modeled itself on the book in a way well, is it even the writer of this book in the documentary? Yeah, briefly? yeah, he's he's like yeah, one of the also, main one of the yeah. main talking heads in the in the documentary. Did they get? I need to rewatch the documentary because, like, in this second book, which I don't even know how much we'll talk about them. I've got two heroes in the second part of the book, but it's probably uh, Meyer, the first journalist, the he's, guy that wrote. Uh, he's in the killing. documentary. Okay, that guy seems awesome. He and, is really uh, cool. Brownlee, I don't know if Brownlee's in the documentary though, but they I, I show really him end up liking Brownlee. Well, they show footage of him, uh, but he's not in. Uh, he's not interviewed in the documentary for yeah, whatever. I get reason. the feeling that he just, after getting kind of like fucked in certain ways, just like ends up like. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, going to live a life of obscurity as a rich lawyer. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if he's rich or not. I'm sure he's doing fine. We'll get to him, I guess, soon. soon. Yeah, yeah, sooner Sorry. than later, probably. So this is, yeah, this is where Oxycontin really takes off. Um, it's approved in 96, and they assemble, like, just an army of, like, vigilant salespeople. Like, <laughs> you know, you know, I was just about to say highly trained, and then I just thought about the fucking people at the chemical the plant. The youngest and hottest. 
I think these people, I think but, the sales people are trained more than the chemical. Plant, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm saying they put way more training and time and money and incentivization into the salespeople than they did, than they do to the people mixing dangerous chemicals. But, um, I guess, of course they did. Right. And, um, yeah, they have this like really, ex- they, they breed like this whole culture of like extreme competition, like, intercompetition within the company amongst salespeople. They have like constant like salesman of the <laughs> I was gonna say salesman of the week, salesman of the day, salesman of the hour. It's like just really intense, like in like tons of bonuses. And I guess one unique thing about the company Purdue was that unlike a lot of other companies with with their sales uh, teams, they didn't put any cap on bonuses. So like if you could just sell the shit out of something, like you would get a lot of money. And uh they also had this thing that they called toppers, uh, which was <laughs> I don't know why. It's like kind of a dumb name, but that was just like the top salespeople of the quarter or whatever. And they would get like hugely incentivized with like lavish vacations to like, you know, exotic locations and stuff. And, you know, just cash and cars and whatever. Yep. Um and it worked because people would be making like 170 grand a month. Yeah, that was one of their f- former, you know, top salesmen uh, is in the documentary as well. I, I, his name is a high school me. teacher guy, right? Was he? I don't. I, the guy, the guy from like West Virginia. Oh no, this is a. That's the other guy. That's the guy Sorry. I'm thinking of. Um, he the was one teacher guy that was the guy that ended up becoming like the the head of sales. I think oh, it's he's a, the one that would go around like hiring people. Um, he, and he ended up in sales cause he was like working at this like super nice private high school as a gym teacher. Oh, you're and, like, the, that's, that's not, that's not Purdue though. Really? That's the, that's when they get into that fentanyl company. I thought he worked for Purdue, the guy I'm thinking of. Oh, maybe. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. No, that's the, I'm, fen- I'm, that's, I'm, the that's the, that's the, that's the in, in in sis or whatever the yeah, fuck. Yeah, sorry, I'm called. I'm just getting a bit muddled. No, it's okay. easy. It's easy to mix them together because this, like, the thing in the documentary in the second half is that it goes into this um this fentanyl company that's like somehow even more like a more extreme version even of Purdue and but they're also just like the natural outgrowth of what would happen yeah. in in a in a market with a company like Purdue. Because they, yeah, they they had the same kind of like crazy sales culture and like um, some of the at least their CEO actually went to jail for five years, but um, he didn't have the pedigree that that gets brought up I think in the last uh, third, which we'll get to next week. But uh, anyway, where was I? Toppers incentivizing. Okay, so I mean, this basically just creates a situation where people are going to like compromise themselves quite a bit, like to get ahead to like make a lot of money basically. Um, and I think a lot of people were tricked, like tricked. I mean, especially salespeople. I mean, you and I were talking about this, I think before we hit record, but like, like who's to blame here kind of thing, like in the, in the grand scheme of things, like obviously like Richard Sackler and the people at the top, they know what's going on. They know what they're pushing. Um, they are very much to blame. And I mean, I guess it's just like maybe a little less blame, like when you go down the ladder, but like, I mean, I think the doctors are to blame for either being corrupt or just like getting totally tricked. Um, and so like basically a a way, the way that, uh, Oxycontin's got pushed so heavily initially and for a while, probably, I guess still to this day, um, it was just through like outright bribing and like and lying, lots of lying, <laughs> so, so much, much lying, lie. <laughs> just endless lies. I mean, the the training videos the, of of Purdue just taught people like these are the lies you must say and say them over and over again. Like uh, shit, I've never written down, but like there some some of the the lies were like um, oxycotton is believed to not have any to have very little chance of being abused something like that i'm totally not wording it right but that was like the line that they were like were told to say over and over again and that that's what was on like the little insert 
you know, along with like the thing about 1%, they'd say like, oh, only like, it, and that was only if addiction came up, like if a doctor asked about addiction, they would go, oh, okay, well, yeah, it's only well, like maybe 1% of people will get addicted to this drug. And that's only if they misuse it. You know, those yeah. dirty drug addicts who choose to misuse these otherwise very safe, non-addictive drugs. That's something I hate in our culture is that people always get blamed for this shit. There's no, like, none of the responsibility has ever been put on, like, literature or, like, what's been sold to the public is always the end user's fault. It's usually not the case. Usually people just fall into traps. Traps that are just too big for people to climb out of. Oh, yeah. I mean, and and the thing is, is, like... <laughs> Even if you wanted to be an asshole and say, like, oh, these druggies, they were already druggies before they started using um, uh, oxycodone. Like, they were already heroin addicts or something. They chose that way of life, you know. Okay, even if you want to say that and, and write off those people and say they they put this, they brought this on themselves, there are millions of cases of people that were using the drug as prescribed who got horribly addicted and died it's in the documentary there's these cases in the book i mean in the documentary there's that 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 older guy talking about his wife like who got oh, yeah, that's caught up caught up sad. with the uh the life was it life tree life tree yeah that fucking asshole i just watched it again like this morning um I hate that guy his last name's Webster. I, I made a point to remember his last name is Webster. Lynn Webster, I think. Dr. Lynn Webster. Everyone remember that name. Dox this asshole. Um, he's, the fact yeah. that he's allowed to walk free in public is fucked. I mean, I think, I think what happened to him is he never even was charged with anything. Like, he just, he, uh, and anyway, the, the reason I brought that up was just like, um, the example in in the in the movie of of kind of a i don't know like a normie person who got like terribly hooked on these drugs like the 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 huge amount of <clears throat> of drugs not just oxycodone too but it was like just this l l massive list and like huge amounts of everything that this evil doctor had her on for some reason the worst part was is she she got off of everything yep um, because, and like, you know, this is pre, you know, smartphones, whatever, but like the, her husband was take, had to take pictures of her, like nodded off, like in weird places around the house. Cause she didn't believe it. And when she saw them, she's like, Oh shit, this is a problem. So she, you know, it was probably pretty painful getting off all those, uh, opiates. And I'm sure um, it was, but she did it and everything was going fine. And then this fucking doctor, Lynn Webster. He called her and said, like, I need to see you about your your case, you know, like, like, you know, f probably saying that he's concerned, a concerned doctor. Well, and he is... just put her back on everything. And then she fucking OD'd. Like, oh, this is the uh, the sad thing about this. Um, when they do like polls of who Americans trust most, doctors and nurses are always the top of the list. And I, and I don't think most doctors or nurses are evil. I actually think most of them are probably good people um like honestly but, but, sure um, but yeah when a doctor calls you up it's hard to it's hard as like a regular person especially if you're experiencing health problems like, oh, you're wrong the guy with all the education you're wrong i should be doing what i'm doing i just feel like it's so weird that he, he initiated this the second contact you know he's a he's a fucking drug dealer i mean no, I, in, I, I in know. the bad sense of I mean, like drug dealer <laughs> i usually don't have problems with drug dealers he's like he's a bad guy drug dealer i mean i know why he did it but i mean i'm saying like it's so unusual like wouldn't that set off like alarm bells i don't know anyway um a lot of information in this section today um yeah so suffice to say oxycontin is a hit it becomes like the most prescribed drug or like the, or you know, the most successful drug. It makes the most money. It eclipses Viagra, which was like the top money making drug at, uh, at the time. And yeah, so like Purdue and Sacklers by extension just start raking in like billions. Like they're making a lot of money. I think one of the 
one of the monthly report like like uh numbers was like a hundred million a month they were making yeah. a lot of money folks <laughs> um and then I don't know i I'm just looking at like some really broad notes here, but like anything else in the sell 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 chapter. Well, I mean, there's like, I think one of the important things is this is from Curtis Wright. And this was the thing that kind of let Oxycontin get away with everything. But Curtis Wright was the person who had approved the line that the delivery system is believed to reduce the abuse liability of the drug. There's the line. Which is how they convinced doctors that it was okay. Because they're like, okay, it reduces addiction problems. There's no peaks and valleys, which... Which um, this is off. This is a little off topic, but the uh, L.A. Times article, Twelve Hours in Hell," does probably the best like job that I've read of any article of explaining why it's fucking bullshit. Because like in studies, oxycontin only lasts for eight hours, which leaves you four hours of just having a fucking uh, valley after your peak, mm-hmm. where you're going to want to use more and more. Which is like the the foundation for for getting being addicted, basically. Yeah. The FDA with this line allows the uh, sales rep or gives the produce sales reps the ammunition they need to like sell the drug um, with impunity. Yeah. I think, I think that it's really important. The, um, the 12 hour relief thing, the claim, cause that, that was a huge part of their, their ad campaign, at least initially. Yeah. Like I saw some pictures of some of the ads um, there in the movie as well, but like, it's like a, it's like an old couple, like fly fishing, <laughs> like, and yep. then there's two little paper cups, like the kind, you know, you would like put pills in or whatever, you know, take a pill with. So th- the whole point is implying like you only need to take a pill twice a day. Because I guess with other pain pills, you probably are taking more, more often because they, they wear off quicker or whatever. Um, but wait, did we already talk about this on the on the recording part or was this before? It's, it's, I don't think we talked about it. Okay. Uh, anyway, the, like most people said that their relief was not for 12 hours. It was more like around eight which which means they were feeling withdrawal symptoms, which means they're going into exactly the same peaks and troughs, I think they call them. I mean, I don't know why, but peaks and valleys um, thing that they say the whole, the drug steers clear of, but it doesn't. Like it specifically is setting up those very things that it says it's not. Um, and like, yeah, this led to to the doctors doing well this was another thing that the sales reps were were had hammered into their heads it was like uh, there was even a, a word for it like titrate yeah like just ratchet up like the the dosage um so like even the salespeople, if you got a doctor to prescribe like the 80 milligram pills instead of the 20 milligram pills you would get like a bonus according like based on yeah. milligrams they were incentivized to get the doctors to prescribe as much as possible. They had no like sales cap for like a commission, which is right. insane. I think it's like unheard of in most sales jobs. And so this, like this, this 12 hour relief lie, which, you know, I mean, even with, even if it was, even if it worked, like it <laughs> addiction doesn't work the way that they're claiming it does. We're like, well, if you don't have these peaks and valleys, what does that mean? Like you just remain like, on the drug all the time like just means that you're steady that you never feel like withdrawal symptoms so you never like want to do more than what's prescribed that's impossible with opiates (laughs) by the the nature of opiates like sure impossible i mean it's like time release cigarettes where the nicotine (laughs) filters through your body all day (laughs) (laughs) that's not when you get rich um i think there's a great line in here Maybe I just like it, but um, where they're talking about the cells, um, O'Keefe's like, um, physicians often scoff at the suggestion that their prescribing habits might be swayed by the uh, blandishments of pharmaceutical companies. This is talking about when all the cells would come in and really try to like convince the doctors to sell mm-hmm. their drugs, doing things like you know bringing them lunch or bringing them free samples, et cetera. And I'm going to skip this stuff, but then he goes on to say, but of course, there is no more true that is this is no more true today than it was when author Sackler said it doctors are human and the notion that donning a white coat might somehow shield them from temptation is fantasy um 
like a 2016 study found that purchasing even a single meal with a value of $20 for a physician could be enough to change the way that he prescribes. And for all the lip service to the contrary, the Sacklers didn't need studies to tell them this. Purdue would locate as much as nine million just to buy food for doctors. I was, I was, I was hoping you had that number. I knew it was some huge number just spent on food. Yeah. So, uh, in 1996, Michael Friedman pointed out that according to Purdue's own data, physicians who attended the dinner programs or the weekend meetings wrote more than double the number of uh, new prescriptions for OxyContin compared to the control group. He noted that weekend meetings had the greatest impact, and even the physicians who took no handouts from the company proved to be highly susceptible to the message Purdue was promoting. The primary goal of medical practice is the relief of suffering, and one of the most common types of suffering that Dr. C is pain. It's amazing to go on pain because pain is so subjective. Um, you've got to You've got a patient in pain, you've got a doctor who genuinely wants to help, and now suddenly you have an intervention that we are told is safe and effective. What the company was really selling, some of Purdue's marketing material suggested, was hope in a bottle. And yeah, this is the crux of it is pain is something that's really hard to answer, and they, they gave hope. They were selling hope, which is often just the flip of despair, but whatever. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> um you know, I guess you could say, I mean, I don't know. I mean, sure, it's it it's a wonder drug <laughs> for people in like like particular excruciating pain, but again, like the whole point is that they they wanted to go after everyone. Like if they if they had the choice to be like we can let all the all we can let the few people in excruciating end of life in cancer pain just let them suffer. But then you can sell like eight trillion oxycotton pills to people with headaches. They would have done that, you know. They didn't have any fucking noble like ideas behind what they were doing. Hope in a but, bottle. Fuck off. <laughs> no, I mean they sold it to the doctors as hope. No, I know. I'm saying just fuck off, Purdue. Yeah. <laughs> You're this liars. Chapter's, this chapter is also the chapter that brings up the salesman Stephen May, who's the West Virginia salesman. Who yeah, that, that's right. Who I think eventually turns against Purdue because like he I think a lot of these people didn't realize especially some of the sales people, like I do think that they I thought I think a lot of them really did believe that what Purdue was telling them was true and that they were selling like at first, like when it's first taken off. I think by the two thousands everyone fucking knows. But I think the first batch of like salespeople are like, Yeah, wow, we really are doing something good for the world which makes it easier to sell when you believe in your product is much easier to sell. Yeah. And the, 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 the checks and the incentivizations don't, don't hurt either. Um, sure. but that, that guy, um, may Stephen may. Yeah. He was one of their top salespeople. And, um, I believe he left the company in like 2003, but in the documentary, he even says like he, by 99, he was pretty sure something fucked up was going on. And yeah. he, he was trying to get, he was trying to be like a good person and he, he was, yeah, he was like emailing his bosses. Being he like, was hey, emailing, we need to like, think about what we're doing. Yeah. He was emailing like the way upper level people and, and they would just respond like, you know, you're not a policeman. Just go sell more pills. Yeah. <laughs> like essentially. Um, but yeah, he, you know, he did leave eventually. So, I mean, good on him for that. Actually, like think at the end of part one of the documentary and it's hard he to a fucking high paying job. I've you're, never done it, but I imagine it's hard. I, I, I have a hard time with it because I've never had a high paying job. Um, sorry. He's, he's the guy who reads, he reads a poem at the end of the doc, of, of like one of the parts of the documentary. Yeah, I think part uh, one about how terrible um, Purdue was, is, yeah. but we should move on to the next chapter. I think. Okay. Uh, and An Hedonia, which is a clever pseudonym. <laughs> um, let's see. This chapter introduces us to a pretty important guy, Barry Meyer. He's a, a journalist. He wrote for a lot of places, but eventually got a job at the New York Times. He was basically one of the first, at least major, major people with like a major audience to start talking about Oxycontin and the Sacklers and Purdue specifically and as being a problem um, around like 2000. 
and I think 2001, he published his first big like front page expose um, about basically the opioid epidemic and uh, what was just all the stuff we've been talking about, basically. Just, um, and he pursues this, though, like over the years, and he eventually ends up writing a book about it. And obviously, Purdue like hates him and they, you know, they try to fuck with his life at some point. Um, at one point, they even get him like they get they convince the New York Times to not let him write about oxy oxycontin or, or yeah, cause about when opioids New York, in anymore. Like 2003, two, New York Times was going through the scandal where um, fuck, I forgot the reporter's name, but he had like it turned out that he had lied about just all of his reporting. It got the New York Times in a lot of shit, so they were worried about anything that might get them in more like public shit. And they had like a big sweeping change of leadership, etc. Yeah, like the new editor was just like a real. <laughs> like he was easily pushed around, I guess. And we, I, we should say also that there's like these three guys who are kind of like, Udell. the more I kept reading the story, the more I kept thinking of them, these three guys who work for Purdue, who I just kept thinking of them as like mafia muscle. Like that's, how, that's what they seem like. That's like their that's role acted, in, the, yeah. in the company. One of them's their One of them is the Sackler family lawyer, Udell, um, Something Udell. I, I, yeah, I felt like Udell names. was the leader. Um, it was like Howard Udell. Um, I don't know. He's the fat one. <laughs> Michael Friedman. He's the skinny one with glasses. <laughs> he was the like chief medical officer or some shit. Yep. A medical officer. That sounds like Star Trek or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he was like the chief like medical whatever, like uh, consultant uh, at, at the company. And then this other guy, Gold Goldenheim, and they would just go around and like push people around, not literally, like, but like in a corporate way, they were just like enforcers for for Richard and for the company. Um, they're like guard dogs, you know, whatever. Um, and yeah, just like bullies, and they're willing to do anything, say anything, lie like crazy. Like, uh, they all lied under oath at different times, just like blatantly. Um, and they're all just like walking around free and rich to this yep. day. Um, but anyway, they're like major reoccurring sort of figures in, in this whole story. So Friedman, Udell and Goldenheim. Um, but yeah, they're the ones who went to the New York times and like threatened the editor. And they said their, their reasoning was so insanely stupid, but it, it worked. They were like, Hey, this reporter, he's got a book about opioids. So whatever he writes about opioids in your newspaper, he's just promoting his book. And that goes against journalistic ethics. And like, first of all, that's not even really a thing, really. Second, he's not promoting his book when he's writing about a subject that he knows a lot about. I mean, it's just so absurd. Enough but, about to write a book. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like he could have wrote a book about it. Um, okay. So, yeah, they, and he, you know, it infuriated Meyer, of course, as it should have. I mean, eventually he does, like, I think a different editor or something. I don't know. He's allowed to, like, write Yeah, the New York Times gets out of its, uh... The dumb, like, slump, slump it was in or whatever, yeah. Um, so, okay. Then in step, Martha West, uh, a.k.a. N. Hedonia. Um, so, Udell, the lawyer, the, uh, the mafia muscle fat man. Um, they mention his weight a few times in the... They do. ...book. But, um, he... Mar he tasks uh Martha West who's uh she's like a secretary that's been working for for the company since like 1979 with going on the early internet in like uh, I think it was 1999 and like scouring like internet boards and chat rooms and shit to see if if people were talking about oxycontin and like or were about they? getting high on it Oh yeah, they were talking a lot about it. Is what she found. <laughs> That's sort of like she found you know, the stuff about the purple peelers and like how people can crush it up and snort it. Um, her story is kind of sad. It uh -huh. is sad, really sad. I mean, so she yeah, reports ruining she, her life. Yeah, uh, she reports all of this back to him, and he's basically like, "Okay, shut up about that. Like, we don't need." And it, it, like slowly, uh, these top top uh executives like Udell and stuff 
uh, at the company, they started getting paranoid about like leaving paper trails and stuff. But I mean, they're still, they still have so many damning emails and documents anyway, but imagine all the stuff they did, they actually did destroy. So, um, um, eventually though, she, she herself gets a, horribly addicted to Oxycontin and like spirals out uh, of control and they just fire her like unceremoniously, even though she's been with them forever. And they're just like, get your junky ass out of our building. And then she sues them and they just like savage her even more in court and she loses. They just like, they impugn her like credibility. Like, weren't you like an alcoholic before you uh, <laughs> took Oxycontin? Didn't so you just, try speed one time in college? Yeah. Yeah. I think that might've been the other lady. They do the yeah, same thing. The they lady. do the same thing to another person as to a salesperson who sues them, um, who quits, um, because she doesn't want to push oxy oxycodone on doctors who don't want to sell it, and so on. Or no, her whole thing was it was an obvious like pill mill. Yeah, you know, a doctor. A, 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 for those who don't know, a doctor's office that like just prescribes to anybody. And um, anyway, that's another part of the book. But um, oh, so, well. And anyway, the reason this chapter is called Anhedonia is just because Martha West. That was her like online. That was her name. Her uh, handle. Um, Anhedonia being like the inability to feel pleasure, which is kind of an interesting choice that for her to make. So what starts to happen is uh, reports just start trickling out and then just like, and then it's just like the faucet gets turned on full blast of like people getting addicted to Oxycontin specifically um, people breaking into pharmacies to steal it. Um, and but, oh, go on. I was just going to say, but for two's lucky, even though all these people are getting addicted to Oxycontin, Generally, people using one drug often experiment with others. So Purdue can always say, oh, but they were doing other stuff, too. Exactly. It's not air fault. They would say, like, oh, those people had alcohol in their system when they OD'd. Like, like that was the problem. Yeah. Or, like, yeah, they, they, they did heroin. It's like, yeah, they did heroin because they couldn't find Oxycontin. <laughs> and they wished that they, they had Oxy it. instead heroin of heroin. Was cheaper. I mean, it's not as good. <laughs> yeah. Um. This at this point in the book, well, I don't know, I'm just seeing a note here, but I just wrote Richard Sackler is a repugnant whiny brat because this is when he he's just starts getting like furious that people are like uh making these accusations against his wonderful company and his wonderful drug. And he's just a real big baby about it and a real asshole. He's just like very much like his uncle Arthur Sackler turning it all around on the user. The user is the problem. The, the user isn't the victim. We're the victim. He literally says, like, Purdue Pharma is being victimized by these junkies. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, at one point, the FDA actually does something kind of <laughs> right. And they make the packaging different on Oxycontin, I guess. Yeah, they like packaging, right? Or it was like, it was just like their most severe warning label, which is like okay, nick nicknamed like the black box. Um, but it, was, it obviously doesn't really, it doesn't really stop anything. I mean, the numbers just keep going up of people using Oxycontin. The tamper proof packaging was Purdue's effort to curb people from misusing T it. Tamper proof or, uh, prescription pads. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, people the, were still a prescription pad at that point. Yeah, they they made like this. They made two really lame gestures when they finally. It took forever for them to finally even admit that people were abusing um, oxycodone. Like they, this this becomes important when in like legal cases and stuff later. But like it's proven that like. People in the upper levels, including Richard himself, Richard Sackler himself. They know shit from like 96 onward. They know shit from even before then. They knew it from MS Cotton. Exactly. They they knew that people were abusing their morphine pills before. They knew people were abusing uh, the Oxycontin. And of course they did. I mean, these people went to medical school for fuck's sake. But I the mean, company they know line is 
the company line becomes they don't know shit until after 2000 yeah the company line is in and it's so they just repeat it like a like a mantra like february 2000 february 2000 we didn't know anything until february 2000 and when we found out oh we were horrified that people would be so terrible with our wonderful drug we'll make a new paper for prescriptions yeah, so they one of their gestures was some sort of tamper proof prescription pad. I don't even know how that would work to be honest. But um, I just imagine it's a pad that accepts invisible ink. <laughs> and then something else they made like some sort of like PSA. It was like, "Hey kids, don't take your parents' pills out of the cabinet." It was like literally oh, yeah, something I remember that this dumb. PSA. You you saw it? I think so. Oh wow. I think me and one of my high school friends in 2001 were making fun of it. Okay, there's this one important thing from from chapter 18 still. Pseudo addiction. <laughs> uh, like a completely ludicrous con- right. lud- ludicrous concept that um I forget the guy. I want to say there's this one really evil guy. Like I just saw him as pure evil in the documentary and then I read about him and I was like, "Yep, that must be the same guy." Haddux. Yeah, he's um, super evil. He's some sort of fucking I don't even know what his like profession is, but he comes into the company just as like a just as like a spin doctor basically. And um he he is also just sort of like a, a spokesman or whatever who just lays out these like bullshit ideas and lies and stuff. And one of them was pseudo addiction. He's like, Are no one no one gets addicted to Oxycontin. They may have a physical dependence, but not addiction. He somehow makes people think there's a difference between physical dependence and addiction, and then, and then they, then I think when they realized that that sounded really dumb, they shifted over to this pseudo addiction concept, which is when they and they like they like peddled this to doctors. They're like, hey, doctors, when a patient seems addicted, they're really just pseudo addicted, and what you have to do this and this sounds like I'm joking, but this is really was their answer to the problem maximize their dose like increase give them, the, give them increase more. the dose of oxycontin yeah, it'll help that's how you get over the pseudo addiction because and i and honestly that is sort of the solution in quotation marks because their pseudo addiction is just their real addiction and them being in withdrawals and like not being able to get reach the same you know levels that they need to reach on the same amount just make sure you're only prescribing two times a day because that's what our uh, advertising literature says. We wouldn't <laughs> want to do three times a day, even though maybe some clinical studies said that you're less likely to actually get addicted if you do that. Yeah, because then you don't hit that withdrawal point. Oh, uh, and also a an anonymous source tips off Barry Meyer with um, a list that was just uh, titled Toppers. Uh, and oh, so it was, yeah. a, it was a list of the 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 top sales reps, and it, and it was like. And where they do all of their, most of their sales, right? What happens and when you superimpose the list over the clinics that are it, pill mills? If you, if you took the, the, if you took a map of the United States and, and it had like where all of the worst like addiction and addiction fueled crimes and so on were pill mills, it happens to be exactly where these top sales representatives were like cranking out like the most sales. So. And Purdue um, knew this. Oh, of course they did. That, that's the other thing is they kept so – they had such close monitoring of their own records and of what the doc, what every doctor they uh, they sold to, basically, like how much they were prescribing, like down to like minute detail. And later on, like at some point when they're – someone's testifying, I forget exactly when, but like uh, this is when they're testifying in front of Congress. I think it's the M- Michael uh, – uh, Friedman, maybe, um, the congressman or whatever <laughs> says to him, like, so you have this like really detailed, like these like incredibly detailed data about all of your sales and so on. So how could you not tell that like certain people were like running it like pill mills, like, and they just keep saying like, well, we're not in the room with them. Like we don't, we don't know like how they're practicing medicine. It's like, you don't have to, like you can see that for like a town, like if, if a doctor is living in a small town 
and they're seeing like 80 patients a day and prescribing huge amounts of Oxycontin to them, it's obviously not for um, therapeutic use, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Pablo Escobar of the New Millennium. I don't know. What happens in that chapter? That this The chapter name comes from what... Like an actual friend, or it doesn't seem it seems like they probably weren't friends after this, but someone that um, Richard Sackler was like confiding in or bitching to more likely actually, like through email, um, about like these junkies are trying to like destroy my empire, and this guy wrote back like I don't think that's true, and I think when you're not so pissed off, you know that's not true, and um, lays out like really common sense stuff. Which Rich, Richard Sackler just dismisses. He's like, he's pisses like, him he, off. He's like, he's like this, like poor people in like the backwoods of Kentucky or whatever. He he uses an example, something like that. Like they don't have time to be quote like upright citizens of or whatever he, he or like to worry about of being Earth. dutiful citizens of of their society. Um, they're struggling. These people struggle and, you know, he's trying to like, he's trying to like make an argument from empathy to like the least empathetic man on, on earth. (laughs) And yeah, it just pisses off Richard Sackler more, but eventually like this guy in, in, uh, the email says like, if you keep this up, something like that, you'll be the next, you'll be the Pablo Escobar of the new millennium. He's much worse than Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Probably. I mean, I'd have to compare the charts and whatnot, but <laughs> I'm sure he is. Well, Pop, I think that, Pablo at least has some noble intentions at times. Yeah, I mean, he did like murder a lot of people with his bare hands and stuff too. But I mean, who's it's a, not really to a, say. Who's to say Richard Sackler has it? I know he hasn't. Those soft hands haven't killed. It. Well, actually, no. He probably just some weird American psycho shit kills homeless and people all those fucking rich people go out to like hunting ranges where they just hunt humans that yeah, they fought. most dangerous game style yeah. probably just fucking employees they don't like anymore yeah you didn't right. meet your sales quota going out to the hunt village boy maybe that's what happened to the guy in the email he's like who's pablo escobar now motherfucker <laughs> um so also yeah then um just more and more things just become are being uncovered by kind of a combination of different attorneys and you local know, newspapers ju- journalists yeah and this all i guess we should just really get to chapter 20 here because i gotta go soon um okay I, i'm i'm looking at my notes for 19 and i think we've kind of talked about all of this basically okay. like they hire like more shadowy evil people to like to plant like good stories about opioids into different publications and to destroy stories that they don't like. And there's some good detailed um, descriptions of that in the book, but like, yeah, and the we only don't really people, have time to go into that, but the only people who just stay the course are people like Meyer who are just refuse to be bought out. Um, yeah. So we get to chapter 20, take the fall. This is a uh, set him right beside my hometown in Albington. Like, 30 minutes away from where I grew up. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's um, Virginia, though, right? Yeah, it's Virginia. But I'm, like, from the Tri-Cities, which is, like, Bristol. And Bristol's, like, famously, like, half in Virginia, half in Tennessee. And then uh-huh. Abington's, like, like, borders Bristol, basically. I used to, like, in high school, drive out to Abington every Friday to watch movies because they had, like, the best movie theater. Is uh does Bristol have like uh competing high school sports teams or just one yeah, high school? <laughs> I think they have two. I'm actually certain they have two. Um so in steps John Brownlee, right? Yep. US attorney for the Western District of Virginia. Um he he doesn't start this investigation, but he kind of takes it over. So like two of his like subordinate lawyers Randy Ramsayer and Rick Mountcastle had already started investigating Purdue for all of their like kind of <laughs> obvious criminality. Um, and John Brownlee kind of hops on board as well. And they pursue it like really intensely for five years and they build like an airtight 
amazing I mean, being case. from Appalachia at this point, which he was from Appalachia, it was impossible not to know somebody or be affected by this shit to some degree, in my opinion. Yeah. Just based on my life experience. Does the book talk about John Brownlee, like seeing it around him? I can't remember. Yeah, no, he's real upset about like just what's going on in his area. Right, right. Um, so to kind of, I mean, it's a little bit of a saga in itself here, but like <clears throat> they, they subpoena Purdue for like documents and um, they'd end up doing this like 600 times, literally. <laughs> yeah. 600 and Pur- subpoenas. And Purdue um, goes through the like, well, I mean, they end up with 600 subpoenas because what happens? The first one, they're expecting it. Purdue's like, okay, we'll send you all the documents. And I guess what's generally the case here, if a prosecutor is subpoenaing you for documents, you just send them literally everything, every but, like receipt, just like what they feel like a warehouse full of the amount of papers they said it's just like i've got it written a thousand or at least this was just at one point i don't know if this probably wasn't even the total but um there was a picture and it was like it was a thousand boxes and there were just millions of pages of documents um yeah it's the it's where you know bury them in paperwork slow them down that way it's like a classic yeah. evil corporation move you know like they're you're trying to hide something obviously sure but then they you know it's funny though because they could be like well look we're being so transparent we're giving them everything (laughs) yeah and the prosecutors are expecting it so they come up with a system to catalog and they work around the clock basically to catalog and as they find interesting stuff they subpoena for more like um more specific documents right which is like their strategy that's how it ends up being like 600 because they like narrow stuff down and start subpoenaing for like okay we want like this quarterly or we want this like this fall about blah 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 right and then they're getting you know emails and uh they did tons of interviews with um like sales reps and 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 employees as well i think they said like something like 300 interviews in any case yeah this was like really thorough like case building and um since (laughs) since it was so thorough and like it was just going to be like a slam dunk of a case, right? Like that's the impression I got. Um, Oh yeah. So Purdue's lawyers of course are like, well then here's what we do. We just don't even let this thing go to court. We We go over their heads. Yeah. So who do they go see, man? (laughs) They go see our podcast favorite, (laughs) Comey, James Comey. Yeah. They want to, they, he was, yeah. He was, was he was the head of the, doj at the time i guess at this point of the book i'm like oh god is he gonna fuck this shit up too (laughs) he doesn't actually but um this time he actually tells brownlee to keep pursuing the case but um but i think it was because james was confused i think that he really thought that he was visited by the chicken company well you know what's funny about that is that i didn't know the purdue company the this the drug purdue company until like you told me about them, like, I don't know, when we I started guess, the podcast. Yeah. Because I think I said the same thing to you. I was like, oh, you mean the chicken people? <laughs> <laughs> you were like, they, you were like, no, I'm talking about like one of the most evil families in the world. I was like, I think the chicken people? J- James, like Udell and the other three. And James got his head, fucking chicken people. Why the fuck are we going after them? And then like Brownlee comes in and is like, no, no, no. They're they're called the open epidemic. And he's like, oh. They didn't tell me that. Fuck. Yeah, we should do something about that. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you you and I had the same like sort of like holding our breath moment while reading that. It was like in steps James Comey. It's like oh shit, is he gonna fuck up their case? But no, he doesn't. Um, they fuck it up other ways though. Yeah, I mean they do. They never truly go to court, I guess. Um, because what happens then ultimately is. Well, before before that, there's a couple other things that happen in the chapter. So, like, we haven't mentioned this at all yet, but there's this um, promo video that was like had a big part in the Selling as like propaganda yeah. for for um, OxyContin and for Purdue itself called "I Got My Life Back." Yep, which was basically like a bunch of people saying like OxyContin is awesome and <laughs> it saved my life, and um, like Purdue was so proud of this video, and they. They made it, right? They definitely made it. Yeah, they, um, they made it. They but didn't they pre- didn't they pretend like they didn't make it at first? I feel like um, I got that impression. 
I'm not sure. Maybe they did. Nah, because they that's the type of shit that they do all the time. I mean, like, they might have had like one of their medical journals that they own make it. That's what I'm saying is like, yeah, when they like when they cite studies that are just studies that like I can't some, remember that some, they paid for. But there's yeah. there's some so like that the the that promotional promo video is brought up like, you know, early on in the book, but like it's brought up again later in this part. And but it's to say that like it wasn't all um that it seemed it might have been. So the legacy of the I got my life back videos, is this what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. Turned out to be more dire even than the prosecutors in Abidon could have imagined for the Sacklers. The suggestion had always been that there is a simple taxonomy. Patients on the one hand, abusers on the other, and that legitimate, legitimate pain patients do not become addicted to Oxycontin. But some patients did become addicted, even patients who appeared and produced own promotional video. According to a report in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, three of the seven patients in the original I Got My Life Back video benefited greatly from Oxycontin, using it to manage long-term pain, but others had more difficulty. One of the patients... Lauren spoke in the video about her severe back pain, but eventually her Oxycontin dose was doubled, then doubled again. She lost her job, could no longer afford her $600 a month prescription that she needed for Oxycontin. And when she tried to cut back, she experienced acute withdrawal. Lauren couldn't afford to pay her mortgage and spent her money on Oxycontin instead. So she lost her car, her home, and eventually filed for bankruptcy. Later, she finally managed to wean herself off the drug. She concluded she said that if I didn't get off this medicine, I'd probably end up dead. They go into the next patient, Ira who um, he ends up dying of like an overdose with pills in his pocket. Then there's the construction worker in the video. He becomes addicted. And at one point, his wife, Mary Lou, told her son, that medicine is going to kill him. And then it did because he died by flipping his hunting pickup truck. And I guess I was right. It was four of the people who died and uh, three who got better. Um, anyways, was this what you were looking for? <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. They also, uh, bef- right before that, they mentioned too that they they had wanted to bring that the construction worker Johnny back. Yeah, because he was so um, personable. They were gonna make "I Got My Life Back" part two, but uh, they didn't do that. Oh no, they did. They did do it, they and did he did appear. He did. He, he did appear. Even, he was on like uh, Don the the Don. He had already. He had like switched to a different medicine. Even, he was doing he like cares. he was ta- he was taking morphine and oxycontin together. And um, but in the I got my life back part two video, he spoke about how he could quote ride a motorcycle now and quote move heavy equipment. He praised Oxycontin for having no side effects, saying, Never a drowsy moment around here. I mean, that's just ugh. also as these court cases are going on, this is the same time that uh Richard, Jonathan, and Kath Kathy, <laughs> Kath, they all stepped down. They yeah, all step into the shadow. Interesting timing, by the way, when this airtight case is looming over their fucking heads. They're like, "Uh, it's time to it's time to uh, do do philanthropy now." Time. They're all at the office, though. They all still come in. They all still well, advise. especially. I think I don't know about the especially other ones, Richard. but I think especially Richard Ri- and Kathy. I get the feeling that Kathy always. Richard that. was insane, though. Like because yeah. e- even the guy, the guy who replaced him as the CEO. Um, which was that Michael Friedman, the uh, fucking piece of shit, liar, medical consultant, whatever, um, slash mafia muscle guy. Um, he was like, Richard needs to back the fuck off because he was just yeah. like, he kept coming into work and just meddling with every like he was just acting like the CEO, but he just technically wasn't anymore. Yep. Um, again, showing his like horrible personality. So who does uh, after Purdue? We were talking about James Comey. So after Purdue <clears throat> petitions Comey for help and Comey doesn't do what they want, who do they get next? Do you know? I do know. His name is Giuliani. Never heard of him. 9-11 Giuliani is oh. his full name. That's a um, name. <laughs> get after a number. Giuliani is such a fucking... I mean, you know, I put I, 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 I put a moratorium on the word ghoul for myself, but I was just going to suspend it for now to say, what a fucking ghoul. I, I never <laughs> say that word, but he is. He's truly or, ghoulish. and um, Or as Brownlee said, he's not a magician. He couldn't change the facts. Yeah, that made Brownlee seem kind of badass. So, like, I mean, you know what I didn't understand about this part, though, honestly? I was just like, I'm a little uncertain. So the Sacklers, they hire Giuliani to talk to 
the prosecution, the prosecutors, basically. Well, but, what they but, want to do with Brownlee, Brownlee, you know, he's appointed as district attorney by Bush, and Brownlee is a politics guy. He wants to get into politics, and what they've usually been successful with is these type of people. They just end up buying them out. So Giuliani's like, he's at this time fucking like he's the Republican to go to. He's probably going to be the next like presidential candidate after Bush. Like figure does his like, you know, second but, term or whatever. Yeah. There were rumblings about that. I don't think that would have ever, ever happened, but so they're, um, they're hoping to get someone like Giuliani to talk to Brownlee, who is, he's a Republican from what I, I mean, he was appointed by Bush. So I assume he's a Republican. Yeah. They're hoping to just like get him on that angle to be like, Hey, give this up. We'll, we'll make it easy for you. We'll get you to a place where you want to be. But Brownlee's like, um, I mean, he's pissed. He's he's from this area where it's getting hit the hardest by this fucking like opioid uh, pandemic or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and, like he, it's more important. Like at this point to Brownlee, this case is more important than like his political aspirations. That's true, and and I, I agree with what you're saying, but it it's all very implied because I I like looked at the part in the book like a couple times. And I was like, am I missing something? I read it like three times because it just like they met. Brownlee wasn't convinced of anything, but it didn't say what he was yeah. trying to be convinced of. I mean, I, I guess think he was trying to be convinced of just letting it go, so letting it go, but it. like in in like a transactional way. Like if you drop this thing, you know, we'll help out your political career. I guess that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, that's that's how I read it. But the other thing yeah. about Brownlee is that he was very, he was like, he really liked the spotlight. Apparently. Yeah. They even they mentioned this detail that he would carry around his own portable lectern everywhere he went, <laughs> which so is pretty hilarious. Nerdy. Um, when you see him in the documentary after reading about him here, it's almost kind of disappointing because, like, I was reading about it, you know, and I was like, oh, this guy's like on the right side of this thing, you know, and then I saw him giving his like press conference in the documentary, and I was like, oh, this guy sucks. <laughs> like, he seems so cool in the book, but. <laughs> I mean, he was still doing the liar. right thing, but I mean, who knows if, he, I mean, I'm sure he did have noble intentions and I don't know why I'm getting so stuck on this small point, but like my, my point is that he also, like you said, what did have political ambitions and he was also doing this as a self-serving way. Cause he thought if I can take down this like major, uh, you know, drug company, you know, like that makes me look like this virtuous, like great person. That's going to help my political career as well. Sure. Um, anyway, like what, what ultimately ended up happening, damn, I got to go really soon is, um, sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, um, anyway, uh, so, so, so the whole thing gets dropped because the Purdue assholes, <laughs> they get a hold of, what has to be one of two people, okay? There's the assistant attorney general Alice Fisher, who would have had authority to just to 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 uh, stop the case, to just make Brownlee drop it, or the deputy attorney general Paul McNulty. It doesn't completely get dropped. What happens is they get Mary Jo White to go to these people, and basically um, Brownlee, what he wants to do is um, get Udell and the other two goons with a. Uh, felony charges so that maybe they'll crack and uh, give up the family. Uh, they go and basically uh, get the attorney general or someone in the attorney general's office. Be like, can't do that. The best you can do is give them misdemeanor charges. We don't even really want to give them misdemeanor charges. So Brownlee has to settle on it. It's like literally all he's allowed to do. And they get the charges. They, they and- don't, they don't throw the case out, but like in effect, they might as well have. They take the charges and um, they take the fall for the Sacklers. The Sacklers are never involved. And the the company's charged a felony charge, but the real fucked up thing about that, and this isn't from the attorney general, is where uh, the Sacklers have shell companies. And instead of um, Purdue Pharma taking the charge, Purdue Fed- Frederick takes the charge. And right. Purdue Frederick we- was their author Sacklers company that made like Valium and stuff. And that was a shell company. So they're the ones who take the charges. They're not allowed to sell drugs under the FDA, et cetera, et cetera, anymore. doesn't matter because the new farm is the one selling the drugs. Yeah. The, the, the chapter is called, uh, taking the, the fall. fall and like the, the real taking the fall was <laughs> a shell c- corporation. Yeah. Like, because these three guys, this is the three musketeer, the three asshole musketeers again, 
here's 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 the ultimate um, justice that happened. The company was was ordered to pay a six hundred million dollar fine, which um, pennies. <laughs> I don't have enough time, but like it's quote like people are quoted in emails and stuff who work for Purdue, literally saying that's a speeding ticket. Like this is nothing, because it is. Look at their net it's worth; pennies. it's nothing. Yeah. And then then they they tacked on thirty four million dollars specifically that the three assholes had to pay. And of course that was just paid for by the company. And then not only that, the company rewards the three assholes, well, two of them at least, by giving them uh, a three million dollar raise and a five million dollar raise. Uh, for oh, their no, for I their felt, suffering. They didn't get a raise, they got they just got paid that money. I mean bonus, whatever. Yeah, yeah they bonus. Left, they left the company and like to take the fall, there's like don't worry, you can't work for us anymore. We'll we'll make sure you're comfortable forever. Oh, I didn't. I didn't even. I mean, I guess of yeah, course they, were they paid left the to company. Just take but... the misdemeanor. Yeah, they they left the company afterwards um, because they got charged the misdemeanors and stuff. And they were shamed. Yeah, but they were just paid off handsomely. They're they're fall guys for the mafia. Yeah, but the thing is, is their fall is just like not a fall. <laughs> that's yeah. my. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is like, oh man. I got $5 million and never have to work again. I really took one for the team. I mean, yes, technically they took the fall for the company, but you know what I mean? Like they no, no suffering. So um, let's see. After all this happened, the same month that they paid Udell 5 million, the Sacklers voted to pay themselves 325 million <laughs> and like parents talk to them, et cetera, et cetera, tell about their kids dying. And um, they eventually find Richard Sackler and under oath, when he's um, asked whether there had been anything in the document in the way of corporate misconduct, it surprised him. He seemed curiously unprepared to answer. And he says, no, nah, I can't say. I don't think so. And as we sit here today, have you ever read the entire document? An attorney asked. And he's like, no. no. He's like, <laughs> he hasn't read the document. He doesn't care about these people. Richard. No, not at all. And the thing is, is like, it's not like he's... Um, like a lazy rich guy. He's like really obsessive about Oxycontin. Right after the court case, um, shortly after the settlement in Virginia, the Sacklers voted to expand Purdue's sales force by hiring a hundred additional reps. It was time yeah. to get back to selling Oxycontin. As for the agreed statement of facts, the recitation of Purdue's misdeeds, which had been negotiated and such um, care by all the attorneys for the company and the department of justice was meant to, Formed the basis of Purdue's good behavior moving forward on the ninth floor headquarters of Stafford, it was not taken seriously. Man, none of it was taken seriously. They just got out of all of it. They they bought fucking officials. They bought the the uh, attorney general. Yeah, and that's rich people. So, and and yeah, I mean, in the in the the conference with Brownlee um, in the documentary, the one of the reporters just asks him like. So wait, did they're still making oxycodone? <laughs> and the guy's like, "Well, yeah." <laughs> Just like cuz he's trying to sound triumphant like they had to pay 600 million dollars. And yeah, everyone's just kind of like crickets, you know. I, and like, I think he knew he was defeated. He like, did, I, but like, you know, he's he's also being like this the kind of showman whatever. Like he's trying to make it true. seem like it was it was some some modicum some of justice, victory, yeah. but like it's not at all. And and it actually, you know, it's almost it's almost worse than not doing anything at all. You know why? Because like it just sets the precedent to all other companies and to that company itself that yeah, you can fuck around and just this is look at what happens. A speeding ticket. Man. And th- and this is in like well, I don't every- think it's Brownlee's fault. He doesn't have anything to do with this. No, no, I'm I'm, just, I'm I'm raging at like the larger thing of like the when that happens to Exxon Mobil for fucking oil spills and you know like all, everything you can imagine when when a company actually gets taken to task in any way and all it is is a speeding ticket. Like, yeah. I mean, I guess like next so week we can we can revel in the fact politics. that. Well, you can revel in the fact that the fucking fentanyl company like crashes and burns at least, but That's true. they just didn't have the right political connections. Is probably the Sacklers why. haven't really went away though. I mean, no, not at all. I mean, Oxycontin is still, from what I understand, like I mean, people understand what it is more now, and doctors don't prescribe it as wildly. I'm pretty sure, but like now it just 
I don't know. Actually, I don't. I, I should probably research what the state of it is now. It's probably sure, talked. We'll, we'll learn more about it in the next part. Yeah, next episode, we'll talk about in it. The book. Um, but yeah. Um, you wanna, any final thoughts? I gotta go soon. Fuck rich people. It's a. It's <laughs> a. It's if you want a good argument for why money has to be taken out of fucking politics, this is. This is reading this type of book and just seeing how much sway they have like laws do not matter to these people they exist in an entire different like world than normal people and um how the fuck are we ever supposed to combat this like this type of monstrosity and most people celebrate it gotta love that free market innovation if we didn't have the free market we wouldn't have time release coding on pills man i don't want to live in a world without that i'm sure we would (laughs) (laughs) um all right. Uh, I guess I will recommend something really quickly. While I was reading this, these 10 or 11 chapters, whatever it was, um, I was listening to Tobacco. <laughs> I like them. And his album, Fucked Up Friends. And I also listened to Black, uh, Black Mammoth Race. What? Super Rainbow. Super Rainbow. <laughs> um which I've recommended on the podcast before, but I want to specifically recommend their album Start a People, I think it's called. Really good one. That one is, I didn't realize how good that one was until the last couple of days, but like, that might be my favorite one now. <coughs> um, so yes. that's my recommendations. I guess I'll recommend music too, just because at the same time I was really into tobacco and Black Moth Super Rainbow, I also really loved Sunlux. I'm not going to recommend any like specific album, but I like Sunlux a lot. Recommend it. I've never heard heard them. I'll send you some of their stuff. I think you'd like it. Cool. From around the same time. Okay, Ooh. so heatdeathpod.com at heatdeathpod Twitter. I got to go to work. Okay, I'll, talk <laughs> I'll to see you later. You later. All right, I'll send you this audio. Okay. Bye. <laughs> first voice recording was made in 1860. It was a 10-second fragment of the French folk song Au Clair de la Lune recorded by inventor Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. But who will make the final voice recording and when? What will it be? Who will hear it?